So Steve George, UAS Integration Office. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Steve George. I'm here with the UAS Integration Office. Um, I'm here on behalf of my boss, who is uh, at Oshkosh this week. And I'm uh, humbled to be amongst such an esteemed panel. And uh, hopefully I can, can stand up and meet to the, uh, to the level that we have up here. Uh, I currently manage the airworthiness section in the Unmanned Aircraft Integration Office. That's mostly the engineering staff working with our colleagues in aircraft certification and the NASA Enterprise Architecture, NextGen, uh, and the Air Traffic Organization trying to understand and, and um, make progress on some of the technical underpinnings that uh, uh, plague the UAS uh, industry. Um, I'd like to start off with a little bit of history. I, I do have a pretty deep background in unmanned aircraft over 10 years, uh, starting with uh, Air 130. And uh, there was an event back in 2004, roughly, time frame, uh, where a group of us uh, went out to Fort Huachuca to, to see the observation, uh, observe the operations of the Hunter and Shadow operations out there at Fort Huachuca. And there was a belief then that, hey, there's no people on board, so there's no human factors uh, implications at all. Well, that's not true. Um, Colleen Donovan was out there with us. I don't know if Colleen is here today or maybe watching. But she brought up all kinds of human factors uh, issues as she, sh you know, it was her first foray, foray into the, uh, the unmanned aircraft. And she brought up things like the primary flight, uh, flight displays, like the basic T that we're all familiar with, mode awareness, caution and warning, enunciation, operational procedures, and Bill touched on a lot of these things. Uh, in addition to things like menu layering, use of colors, um, and the pilot and physically not on board to sense what's going on uh, in managing the aircraft operation. So that was kind of like the first, hey, there are a lot of human factors issues associated with unmanned aircraft. <laughs> Um, early, you, you, UAS became kind of a victim of their own success because uh, they were initially technology demonstrators for the military and uh, public aircraft operations, and they provided so much now operational capability that they were fast-tracked through the system. And uh, my belief, and, and I think it's shared by most of the folks, that the engineering and development process was fast-tracked to get that operational capability for many different public aircraft operators. One of those uh, short circuits, so to speak, was a, a disciplined look at some of the human factors and, and seeing the flight crew interface to a, a brand new technology and capability. Uh, fast forward about 10 years, and this wasn't too long ago, there was a large, relatively large UAS, I won't say which one or operated by whom, um, flying relatively high, uh, everything was normal, and then something odd started to happen and the, uh, the UAS had a fairly rapid rate of descent uh, and the pilot was a bit confused because he was seeing large rates of descent and a very um, slowly increase in airspeed. So he was confused with what was going on by the information that was provided him. Uh, as it turned out, what happened is the aircraft, um, because of the way that the, the, the flight controls and particularly the throttle controls were involved, it went into beta mode, which means that the prop went into a pitch to provide reverse thrust in flight. So there came the result of the high rate of descent and not rapidly increasing airspeed, which became confusing. The problem was that the, the beta indication on the display was a white circle that showed the pilot it was in, data, it was in beta mode. But the aircraft's uh, screen was against a white background with clouds, so he had no indication that the aircraft was in beta. And of course, by the time um, several thousand feet below, it, it resulted in a, a loss of control and crash. But I think it highlights uh, something very simple in terms of human factors and the pilot getting the information that he needs. We've come a long way since then, and there, you know, now we're going into the, um, uh, the civil environment. And there is a wealth of human factors, guidance, uh, tools, processes on the design of aircraft uh, that are directly applicable to UAS. Uh, my view is that we have a threefold problem that we're having to deal with now. Uh, first, that's it is dealing with the legacy equipment that were rapidly fielded, and they didn't have the or afforded uh, the human factors discipline and the design and operation. Second is education of our new entrants, especially for the civil world, to let them know there is a plethora of information, guidance, um, uh, and, and processes to assist in, in incorporating human factors into the design. The third is the new human factors unique issues. Um, things like automation and autonomy, and, and how the, the pilot functions are allocated between the aircraft uh, aut automation and the pilot himself. Workload assessments become a big part of that. 
Mode awareness is a big issue. Display of the flight information for essential flight uh, information versus what's referred to as situational awareness. It's a dirty word to me, but okay. Um, and then how to replace things with pilot eyes. So pilots do a lot of things with natural human vision that are gonna be replaced with a, a new sensors and, and computers and displays. Um, how do we prove that those things are sufficient and how do we get them authorized for use? So those are th that's just my perspective in um, how I've seen things mature over the past few years. Um, and I thought those would be useful in terms of opening up with some human factors uh, related stuff. Now, given that we are the UAS integration office, our mission is to, is to lead but not own. We basically work with all of the policy offices and the staff offices across the organization uh, to ensure that the right material is being developed at the right time and assist those organizations like aircraft certification, flight standards, air traffic, and, and trying to homogenize and make sure that things fit well and that it works together like a well-oiled machine. That's the vision. Um, we are still in the process of, of congressional reprogramming that will recognize our office. And uh, Earl Lawrence is our ex senior executive director. Um, Bill Crozier is the, uh, his deputy and then the entire organization will fit in as soon as the congressional reprogramming is out. The first thing that we've got that's come out recently is our final rule on part 107, which is operations for small UAS. Um, it basically goes into effect and becomes effective on the 29th of August, if I'm not mistaken. And um, our current section 333 operators, which are basically exemption holders, uh, can operate under the conditions and limitations of their 333 and operate under the Part 107. Um, they can't really mix and match from the rules. If they remain under 333, uh, then the conditions under their 333 approvals still apply and they have to operate under those conditions. Some aspects of the 107 rule, it's um, uh, non-recreational operators. They have to hold an airman certificate. They have to be 16 years of older and they have to p uh, pass a TSA screening. Uh, the rule doesn't change any guidance or regulations for hobby aircraft. So the hobby, hobbyists will be able to operate as they have in the past. The uh, remote pilot certification is basically just a knowledge test in the TSA uh, uh, background check. Um, as far as the Part 61 pilot certificate holders, they have to hold a current pilot certificate um, issued under Part 61. Uh, they have to complete the training course on the FAA safety team website. Um, they have to uh, complete an 8710-13 air airman uh, certification form uh, and then contact the FISDO uh, and an FAA designated pilot examiner uh, and an, uh, I guess that's an airman certification ACR or an FAA certifi certified flight instructor to make an appointment. The FISDO, uh, DFE or ACR can then issue a temporary RPC uh, while the, the permanent is mailed. So that's the existing Part 61 uh, requirements. Um, under the Part 107 small UAS rule, <coughs> there's an online training course uh, for Part 61 pilots and it covers applicable regulations relating to small unmanned aircraft, effects of weather uh, on aircraft and performance, small un unmanned aircraft loading and performance, emergency procedures, crew resource management, determining performance of small unmanned aircraft, and maintenance and pre-flight inspection procedures. The basic operating requirements under Part 107 um, are that the UAS must be under 55 pounds, um, maximum operating altitude of 400 AGL or less, maximum airspeed of 100 miles per hour or 87 knots, that the operations are limited to Class G airspace, visual line of sight, no operations over people, must yield right of way to manned aircraft, uh, one operator per UAS at a time, and external load operation only permitted if they don't affect flight operations or control. So I think with that litany of limitations, you immediately see um, the, I, I guess the limitations in terms of the utility that, it, that the rule provides. So it's great for the small UAS, the quadcopters, the things under 55 pounds, um, and it provides for commercial operations as well, so they can go in and make a, make a profit out of the operations that they're doing. But there are a lot of things beyond that that the industry is looking. Things like beyond visual line of sight, um, operating directly over people, operating at night. And we have a number of initiatives within our office that are working that. We've got the um, <clears throat> micro UAS uh, arc, sort of arc. They're working on trying to establish 
what would, be, what would be the criteria to operate under Part 107 directly over people? The approach that is being taken now is a kinetic energy approach, basically trying to say what kind of damage or serious injury could occur if it fell directly on top of a, of a group of people. The further one is looking at what are repeatable processes, and that's under one of our Pathfinder uh, projects, to establish what would be required for them to routinely operate directly over people safely um, without the other limitations like weight, um, visual line of sight, or sorry, weight, um, and uh, altitude restrictions. <clears throat> Another one of our Pathfinder efforts is looking at extended visual line of sight. So uh, you know, it, it, it's, its general applicability are things like operating over crop fields um, and de uh, not densely populated areas where you're trying to do some kind of activity like uh, crop inspection where you can operate beyond your ability to see the aircraft but augmented by some kind of displays or other risk mitigating procedures such that you don't pose a hazard to other people and property on the ground or other users of the airspace. Our third uh, pathfinder is looking right at beyond visual line of sight operations. What does that require? How do you get the aircraft to operate where the pilot can't see it, has no um, direct uh, acquisition of the environment of, where, of uh, where it's operating, and how can it be conducted safely? That has implications on the C2 link, has implications on detect and avoid capability, um, has implications on pilot information for primary flight control, et cetera, and figuring out what that balance and relationship is between automation and pilot functions. Last thing I'll talk about is some of the research act activities that we have going on. We have an entire research division within the AUS organization that, that works with our partners in ANG um, and the, uh, the research executioners, our center of excellence, um, and our UAS test sites in uh, performing, collecting, and analyzing research data uh, to try and inform uh, policy development, future rulemaking, development of standards, um, how we do methods of compliance for things that are unique to UAS. All that research is being managed through our uh, research division and worked closely with uh, the, the offices like Aircraft Certification as the sponsors. We have our own sponsored research, um, other organizations like the Air Traffic Organization, and being sure that we're getting the right research data in to inform the policy rules and guidance that we need to develop over the course of the next few years. We're also working with partner agencies like the XCOM to align research priorities across government. Um, the integration office is developing a research inventory mapping database to be able to engage and broadcast a set of external stake stakeholders in the UAS community to collect and share the, uh, uh, the research related data externally to our other stakeholders. Four key areas of research have been identified in the human factors research area and that is function allocation, control station requirements, pilot training and certification requirements, and visual observer requirements. Our partners at the Alliance for System Safety of UAS through Research Excellence, which is ASSURE, if you've heard that before, um, and the Center of Excellence include Drexel University, University of North Dakota, New Mexico State University, and Ohio State University. So in a nutshell, that the objective here was to kind of cover what we as the, uh, the integration office are involved in that influences or informs or requires input from the human factors community. Um, and at the end of the panel, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have as a result. So thank you very much for your attention. On to you, Bill. Very good. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Davis. I'm the executive director for emerging technologies for the air traffic organization. And uh, as you can imagine, my, uh, my interest and concern is uh, not so much with the individual platforms like Steve was just talking about, but more how do you take those platforms and then operating in, in, a, in, the, in the national airspace system, otherwise known as the NAS. The NAS is really a system of systems, and, and it's dominated uh, historically by um, uh, manned aircraft, and the operation of those manned aircraft have typically been point-to-point -point operations, airport to airport. And for the last 70 years or so, we've, we've really focused a lot of energy on making those airport to airport operations uh, as efficient and effective and safe as possible. We've done a ton of human factors research around uh, pilot to controller, controller to pilot, pilot to pilot, all, all the different things about operating manned airplanes in a point-to-point -point system which attempts to m maximize the, 
the, the delivery of, of airplanes, manned airplanes typically, and helicopters and so on, of course, uh, bet between airports. Now enter UAS, and uh, airports are of some significance to some UAS operators, the big ones, particularly if you're looking at cargo operations and those kinds of things. But uh, for the majority of many operators, airports are not, nece not a necessary part of, the, uh, of their operation. To some degree, they're, you could argue that they get in the way. Um, and so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of how we integrate UAS operations uh, into a manned operating system, into the, into the legacy system, which has to continue. The legacy system is uh, critical to the economic, uh, defense, security um, uh, uh, aspects of our country. And uh, it, it, will, it needs to continue, and we need to allow it to grow and, and improve safety and do all those things while we, while we intertwine um, this whole new emerging technology of, uh, of unmanned systems. So I would say, while, while you just heard a, uh, a, a lot of research about uh, things that are going on for developing a platforms, re regarding inter interoperations in the NASA, I'm going to say we don't know what we don't know. I mean, it's not like we're, that we know nothing. I mean, we, we have a, a history, a rich history of research with controllers and pilots operating manned airplanes. What I'm proposing is we need to look at, at those pieces and look where we've had big returns um, and, and made big gains. And, and some of them are pretty obvious. And, and, I would, and I, what I would say is I would challenge the research community to start looking at this and, and approaching us, approaching the operators of the system is that, you know, have you considered this? Have you considered this? If, if you sit back and wait for us to come, to come to you with a research plan, we're probably uh, way too late in the process. So, so we need you to be much more proactive in thinking about this and, and, and looking at the history of, of the man system and say, for example, phraseology. So there's phraseology that's, that we've worked for 70 years on. In the man, and we and we get pretty good. There's still issues with it, um, and we um, and uh, if we have time later on, I've, there's there's great examples. But um, but phraseology is an interesting one between controllers and pilots. Well, now there's phraseology that that may not even that, that probably won't be spoken, which has kind of been the historical um, uh, process and, and until the arrival of datacom and other things. Much much of the phraseology has been has been a controller talking to a pilot. Well, now we're going to do it via via link, um, Twitter or email or whatever whatever link you happen to be on. And, uh, and we have a, the, the community that is entering the system now, many of which are not, are not aero, aero or NAS savvy, if you will. Um, they have not, they don't necessarily uh, come with a, with a huge background um, and have not gone through the huge barriers to entry that, that, the, that the legacy system imposed on people. If you wanted to be a pilot in the legacy system, you had to, you had to go to flight school and, and make some investment. And get some experience. If you want to be a controller, you had to, you had to, you had to get hired, make it through the training, which is rigorous, and and get some experience and and build that. If you wanted to be a mechanic, same thing. If you want to be an airplane owner, big barriers, very expensive, fuels expensive, maintenance expensive, big barriers to entries in the legacy system. That had a that had a um, a modulating effect on kind of who was in the system. If you were if you were operating in the NAS, you pretty much had an you had you had skin in the game. You had an incentive. Now a couple hundred dollars. A credit card a 12 year old can get out and buy and buy a really cool system at, at Sam's and be and be flying the next afternoon I mean uh, so the barriers to entries are, are gone <coughs> so we have a huge we have a huge uh, challenge in front of us uh, educating uh, the, the nation if you will maybe the globe I guess probably the better way to look at it on how, on how this UAS system which we all want to grow and flourish and we all see huge benefit in um, I don't think anybody can test that but, but it has to grow and flourish uh, and, and emerge in a way that, that allows the manned system to operate um, and, and grow and flourish and thrive and survive and so on. So that's the, for, 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 from the ATO perspective, I, I submit that's the real challenge. It's, 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 it's emerging the different systems. Um, so there's things like just simple things that, that we all have. I mean, I'm a pilot by background, so I, so I, I know and have focused on things like phraseology, a very, very, uh, a very basic one. Um, another one is uh, <coughs> like just let's just, just talk about just distraction. We know that's a long time, a long time human factors issue. Um, the, the current legislation calls for for UAS operators. Uh, Steve mentioned modelers. If they want to operate within five miles of an airport, to, to notify the airport authority and if and the ATC, ATC facility if one's available. Most people interpret that as call. Well, that's that's a little problematic from the ATC side in that we don't manage traffic via the telephone. 
we have a whole infrastructure to set up with with uh, radios and, and frequencies and flight plans and all those kinds of things with which we manage the manned system. And, and now you, you potentially interrupt or you potentially inject a whole new kind of operating paradigm that has not been uh, kind of reviewed, studied, analyzed. And distraction is probably one of the most fundamental things that, that we know is a human factors problem, either interrupting checklists, interrupting workflows, interrupting controllers, um, um, managing multiple airplanes, and so on and so on. So the, the, the human factors from a NAS systems point of view is replete with human factors work that needs to be done. And, and, we, and we need human factors specialists to wade 